Quantrill's Raiders, the Hole in the Wall Gang, colorful names for bands of outlaws that roamed the West during and after the Civil War. No one earned more fame, however, than Jesse James, the Robin Hood of Western outlaws. Most historians maintain that Jesse was killed six years after his doomed Northfield, Minnesota raid. Yet in 1948, J. Frank Dalton claimed he was Jesse James. Is it possible that Jesse James could have perpetrated a hoax on the entire country for over 60 years? presents information based in part on theory and conjecture. The producer's purpose is to suggest some possible explanations, but not necessarily the only ones, to the mysteries we will examine. James was a lad who killed many men. He robbed the Glendale train. And he stole from the rich to give to the poor. Everyone knew of his name. Jesse had a wife to mourn for his life. Two children, they were brave. But that dirty little coward that shot Mr. Howard laid Jesse James in his grave. It was on a Saturday night. Jesse was alone. Talking to his family so brave Robert Ford came along like a thief in the night And laid poor Jesse in his grave Jesse had a wife to mourn for his life Two children, they were brave But that dirty little coward that shot Mr. Howard laid Jesse James in his grave. Yeah, that dirty little coward that shot Mr. Howard laid Jesse James in his grave. On April 3rd, 1882, Jesse James was straightening a picture when suddenly a gunshot was fired. Reports said that Jesse James was dead. Was it really Jesse James who was shot in the head that day in Kearney, Missouri? By examining his life, we will perhaps find an answer to the question of his death. Jesse James is the only outlaw whose birthplace has been immortalized as a state monument. The house's curator is Dr. Milton Perry. Jesse James is America's Robin Hood in legend. I don't think there's any question about that. The famous Robin Hood story uh, is the one in which Frank and Jesse were returning from a robbery, and depending upon where you've heard it, it could have taken place in Missouri or Arkansas or Kentucky or, or wherever, and they stopped at a farmhouse and asked for, for lunch. The farm lady, and that was a customer at the time, consented and was fixing their meal, and while she was doing this, they noticed she was crying, and they asked her the reason why, and she said that she was a widow with two young children, and that the house was, was, was a mortgage, and the mortgage would be foreclosed that afternoon. So Frank or Jesse supposedly tell her that they are Frank and Jesse, and they would like to help her pay off the mortgage, and they ask her how much it was. She named the sum, they gave her the money, they left, the banker came, the mortgage was paid, it was burned, but strangely on the way back, the banker was ambushed by two masked men who stole all the money he had. John Quantrill led a group of ex-Confederate raiders of which Frank and Jesse were members. Frank and Jesse both joined Quantrill's raiders during the Civil War because they were a very popular unit from this area, and they were directly associated with a number of Quantrill's men. And during that period of their career, as a part of the uh, operation of the guerrillas, 
they would capture towns and, of course, among the towns, in the towns were the banks. And so they had perpetrated daylight bank holdups as a part of their military actions. But strangely enough, it had never been done in peacetime until it would happen here in Liberty. The Liberty Bank raid, recreated from eyewitness accounts, established a method of operation for Jesse and Frank. Jesse, the more aggressive, would charge forward while Frank held bank personnel at bay. On their very first holdup, they managed to secure more than $70,000, a small fortune at that time. The gang was probably originated with Frank and probably at Frank's instigation along with, with other people. Jesse seems to have joined the gang more as an afterthought than anything else, but he gradually became the leader of the gang, probably because he was more of a team person and was probably a more popular person and convinced people to his ways. Jesse was much more outgoing than Frank, very friendly, had a very strong sense of humor, and was a very easygoing person and had a lot of friends and knew a lot of people. Frank was just the opposite. Frank was very quiet, very dour, very taciturn, probably never told a joke in his life, liked to read, could quote Shakespeare, and was a very, very private person. It's an interesting story that they managed to, to stay in business for 16 years, and they were never caught. Jesse, of course, was killed, and, and Frank surrendered, partially because of the fact that they were very popular in the, in the way they operated. You have to remember, that they, that they concentrated on banks and railroads. They didn't hold up the corner grocery store, they didn't mug people for the milk money, and they didn't burglar people's homes. They became very popular in that banks and railroads were among the most hated institutions by the average people in the country. So they had lots of friends, and these friends would hide them out. <laughs> By 1876, the strain of outlaw life was taking a toll on Jesse and the gang. Jesse was forced to tour saloons looking for members who had been drinking. The risk of being seen in town before a job cut the odds of getting away. Jesse was afraid that someone might recognize them and set up an ambush. September 7th, 1876. Jesse and his seven followers carefully prepared for their raid. No pistol or horse went unchecked. The gang had established a reputation for being nearly fanatical in the way they readied themselves for holdups. Little did anyone know that this would be the last raid for the entire gang. They donned their infamous white dusters for the holdup. By now, after so many successful bank raids, they were almost arrogant in their approach. Some two miles out of Northfield, they set their plan in motion. Now they were ready. Jesse had decided that they would split into two groups, each entering town from opposite directions. Northfield was a small community of 500 people. It was a center for agriculture, industry, and banking trade. Their target bank was, in fact, the point of deposit for a number of smaller area banks. Jesse was not known to the Northfield people. The gang came under instant suspicion because of extremely fine horses they were riding and the startling appearance of their linen dusters. As the group rode in, they warily inspected the town looking for anyone who would spell trouble. Little did they know that this raid would be the end of their long string of successful bank robberies. 
As always, Jesse James leaped over the counter, demanding that the money be handed over. Several of the bank employees grappled with the bandits. In the confusion, one of the tellers escaped, yelling, murder, murder. Jesse fired at the fleeing man, but missed. Had the town been warned? It seemed so. Within minutes, armed townspeople began shooting at the dead. Killed instantly were Clee Miller, Charlie Pitts, and another member of the gang, Bill Edgewood. Jim Younger and his brothers Bob and Cole Younger were wounded. Only the James boys escaped unharmed. There were falling outs between Frank and Jesse, and as a matter of fact, after Northfield, the rift became very, very great, and at the time Jesse was killed, it's very possible that Frank and Jesse weren't even communicating with one another. After the Northfield raid, the prices on Jesse and Frank's heads continued to grow. Bounty hunters and adventurers began tracking the brothers in order to earn the ever-increasing reward. No longer were the James boys protected by the friendship of numerous people. Bob Ford is the man most historians claim killed Jesse James. There are, however, conflicting stories about Jesse's death. Jesse was planning the robbery of the Platte City Bank with Charlie and Bob Ford. Zerelda James, Jesse's wife, was working in the kitchen while Jesse laid out his ideas for a successful raid. Uncharacteristically, Jesse took off his gun so that he could more easily straighten the picture. Charlie Ford motioned to his brother to stand. Bob, being the more accurate of the two men, stood, took careful aim, and shot Jesse in the head. Both Ford brothers claimed it was an accident. Could it be, however, part of a plot to end the pursuit of Jesse? It is known that Jesse's mother refused to identify the body. Some have said that the man shot was not Jesse James. Others have said that James lived incognito for the next 60 years under an assumed name. In 1948, a man by the name of J. Frank Dalton came forward claiming that he was the real Jesse James.
Dalton went so far as signing an affidavit to the effect that he was Jesse James. According to newspaper clippings of the time, some 25,000 people turned out for a parade in Lawton, Oklahoma, showing off Dalton as the real Jesse James. It seems almost inconceivable that an imposter could have been in Jesse's place. Yet only a few relatives had pictures of Jesse, which is one of the reasons he had eluded capture. Carl Brian, a respected historian of the James robberies and author of The Escapades of Frank and Jesse James. The statement that Mrs. Zerelda James stated the body was not that of her son Jesse James is not too hard to understand because during the Western days, uh, there was a lot of people who would not identify outlaws and so on in order that the reward would not be paid. But later on, she says it was, and Zerelda James did admit that it was her son, and there's no question that it was. After being on public display, Jesse was buried at his mother's home. Interestingly enough, he was later moved to a public cemetery. There's absolutely no question, but Bob Ford killed Jesse James. I don't think there's any question that Bob Ford killed Jesse James on that day as he says he did. Dalton maintained that it wasn't Jesse who was shot, but a man named Charlie Bigelow. No one has ever been able to identify who, who Charlie Bigelow was. There was no gang member ever named Charlie Bigelow. And as far as we've been able to find, we've never found any instance of anyone that they associated with named Charlie Bigelow. Ironically, however, John Nicholson, Jesse James' grandnephew, was able to lead in search of cameras to the very site where two Bigelow brothers were buried. Nicholson explains what he knows about their mysterious deaths. The Bigelows were buried in the old Haynesville Cemetery, all uh, right up by Holt, Missouri. Their gravestones have fell over and very hard to find. And I've heard my grandfather say that they was hauled up there in a, in a an old spring wagon and that the blood was running out into the spring wagon on the ground when they was hauled up there in the, because there was no embalming at that time. As far as I know is I've heard that Jesse and Frank killed him, but I, as far as that, I couldn't say for sure. Both grave markers bear the year 1884. If John Nicholson's story is correct, the Bigelows would have been buried two years after Jesse's death in 1882. And John James was in the picture in 1935. He came forward and said that he was Jesse James. He had the same name, but no relation. And there was a famous trial in Excelsior Springs at that particular time for this disproving or proving that he was Jesse James, and he could not even name the, uh, his half-brother's name. And it found out that he uh, was using the same story that Dalton used, that Biglow was uh, transferred to be Jesse James, and he was killed so Jesse could get away. And, of course, Jesse James was such a family-loving man that even if the story had been true, he would have never left his uh, family destitute like they were for many years after his death. Jesse James was a lad who killed many men. He robbed the Glendale train. And he stole from the rich to give to the poor. Everyone heard of his name. Jesse had a wife to mourn for his life. Two children, they were brave. But that dirty little coward that shot Mr. Howard laid poor Jesse in his grave. It was a Saturday night and Jesse was alone, talking to his family so brave. Robert Ford came along like a thief in the night and laid poor Jesse in his grave. 
Jesse had a wife to mourn for his life. Two children, they were brave. But that dirty little coward that shot Mr. Howard laid Jesse James in his grave. Yes, that dirty little coward that shot Mr. Howard laid Jesse James in his grave. Jesse James, both in this country and abroad, is one of the best known Americans of all Americans who ever lived at any time in any period. And he's also the Robin Hood, the romantic figure in our folklore and legend and history. And I think it's because Jesse James had style. I think he had mystique. He was daring. He was a, a cavalier type person. And I think it captured the public imagination then, and I think it still captures the public imagination because it's a very romantic time. I maintain that if there wasn't a Jesse James, he would have been invented. As far as I know, they never robbed an individual. The only thing they robbed was banks and trains. I can't... Uh, I've never been ashamed of being Ken Doan, as far as that goes. Well, it seems to me that anyone like Jesse James or the Younger Brothers or Dillinger, the more time that passes, they become more folk heroes and people like to talk about them, especially in Missouri and the border states where all this happened during the Civil War. And I think that Jesse James, to become a legend, died at the right time. Both men are now dead. Who knows if the true Jesse James is buried in the plot in Kearney, Missouri.